Allies have landed in Italy, which is occupied by the Germans. In their advance towards the north, where Mussolini is still in control, the American, British, Canadian and French armies are held up by the solid German defence belt along the Gustav Line in the area of Monte Cassino. Perched on top of the mountain is historical St. Benedict's Monastery. The Allies think that the Germans have turned this 1,400-year-old monument into a lookout post. More than 200 Allied bombers will drop over 500 tons of bombs on the monastery. In World War II, nothing is sacred. It turns everything into an inferno. their attack, but the German paratroopers push them back. The German shock troops are now firmly entrenched in the ruined monastery. Nothing was achieved by the bombing. These scenes were filmed by the American director John Houston, who was sent to this front in Italy. He would later say, it was a massacre in the freezing cold. And yet Churchill had called Italy the soft underbelly of Europe. By moving in from the south via Italy, Churchill's aim was to take Berlin before the Russians could. The Red Army continues to advance steadily from the east. Kiev is liberated. The German Wehrmacht army pulls out of the Ukraine, obeying Hitler's orders to systematically destroy everything. In Italy, several months later, the Wehrmacht is still holding the Gustav Line and Monte Cassino. The French general, Juin, proposes to surprise the Germans who have left those slopes, thought to be too steep, undefended. The rugged soldiers of the North African and Polish regiments, however, managed to climb up the mountain and put the Allies on the road to Rome. the Wehrmacht retreats. It once again leaves a path of destruction behind it. But together with Mussolini and his remaining fascists, the Germans will retain control of northern Italy and its industries. They are the target of attacks by Italian partisans, and they retaliate with indiscriminate violence. At the same time, in southern England, the Allied war machine assembled for the Normandy landings is gearing up. On the evening of the 5th of June, the paratroopers get ready to leave, decked out in their Indian-style war paint and haircut to make themselves feel brave. The supreme commander of the Allied forces, General Eisenhower, comes to tell them, you are about to embark upon the Great Crusade. The plan is to land on five beaches along a 100-kilometer stretch of the Normandy coast, from the Seine to the Cotentin Peninsula, where the German Atlantic Wall defenses are the weakest. At midnight on June the 5th, British gliders and Dakotas full of British, American and Canadian paratroopers slip silently inland over the Normandy region. The paratroopers are the first to set foot in occupied France. 
Their mission, to secure the flanks of the landing zone. The Allied fleet is on its way. It is the biggest armada ever assembled. Nearly 5,000 landing ships and assault craft. Yet it is not detected by the Germans, who are prevented from carrying out reconnaissance flights by the stormy weather. Bombardment and shelling from the battleships pound the coast, but completely miss their targets on the beach codenamed Omaha. The German bunkers remain intact. The first assault wave of American troops is getting ready to tackle the German defenses on Omaha Beach. Among them is American writer Ernest Hemingway, who is a war correspondent. He writes, As we moved in towards land in the grey early light, the coffin-shaped steel boats took solid green sheets of water that fell on the helmeted heads of the troops, packed shoulder to shoulder, in a stiff, awkward, uncomfortable, lonely companionship of men going to a battle. Another war reporter, the photographer Robert Capper, is also caught up in this inferno. He says, it was the ugliest beach in the whole world. Exhausted from the water and the fear, we lay flat on a small strip of wet sand. Over 2,000 American soldiers will lose their lives here. As the tide rolls in, the soldiers are trapped between the sea and gunfire from the German blockhouses. Eisenhower had prepared a communique in case the landing failed. In a handwritten letter, he said, My decision to attack at this place was based on the best information available. If there is any blame or fault attached to the attempt, it is mine alone. But a small group succeeds in climbing up under enemy fire and neutralizing the German cannons with the help of the Royal Air Force's fighter bombers. In the meantime, the Canadian troops have landed on Juno Beach. There is indeed very little resistance, only a few shots that do not deter the British on the next beach along. The few German defenders who survive the bombardments finally surrender. British and French commandos land on the fifth beach. The Allies plan to land 326,000 men. In just one week, a daily average of 10,000 men, 3,200 vehicles and 15,000 tons of supplies are ferried across. In order to accomplish this, a harbour is needed. But the Allies decided to stay away from the big ports, which were too well defended, and to land on the beaches of Normandy. Instead, they brought their harbours with them, gigantic construction kits called mulberries, 146 concrete caissons, 61 metres long and weighing 6,000 tonnes, were assembled to create breakwaters and piers, where the Liberty ships, as they were called, could unload their cargo. American shipyards had turned out one of these ships every day. In less than three years, the war industry has turned the United States into a superpower. The country has mobilized more than 11 million men. Its armies are now in France, Italy, North Africa, and Asia. The power of the United States is such that just a few days after the Normandy landings in Europe, it's able to assemble a second fleet on the other side of the world, in the Pacific, in order to attack the Mariana Islands, which are under Japanese control. Having taken the island of Tarawa the year before, the Americans now want to use the island of Saipan as a base for bombers taking off for Japan. Some 127,500 troops, two-thirds of them marines, prepare for combat. 
15 aircraft carriers and 900 planes will crush the Japanese Air Force in an air battle which will come to be known as the Great Marianas Turkey Shoot. blow is also dealt to the Japanese Imperial Navy. After which Japan's defenses in Saipan are battered. But when the Marines land on this tiny island, which is only nine kilometers wide, one of the bloodiest battles of the war begins. Over 15,000 Americans and at least 27,000 Japanese will be killed or wounded.